And I would say optimistically that this is maybe the death knell of the patriarchy. You know, it's like kind of the last panicked, you know, the cornered vicious animal, <laughs> you know, of male domination. Um, even before Trump was elected, I, I came to realize that how we treat nature is often how we treat women. And that until we treat women with respect and dignity, we can't treat nature with respect and dignity. So they're, it's all connected. And I would say, I would put race in there as well. And I think what's come out a lot for um, those of us in America who are paying attention is the connection between not just pa patriarchy, but racism in agriculture in America and how we're still kind of operating on this kind of plantation slavery model, even though it's not a legal um, model. Maria Rodale is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Maria is an author, activist, and detective in search of the mysteries of the universe. She is the author of the following books, Scratch, Organic Manifesto, Betty's Book of Laundry Secrets, It's My Pleasure, and Maria Rodale's Organic Gardening. From 1986 to 2017, she spent her career in the family publishing business, Rodale Inc., which published the magazines Men's Health, Women's Health, Prevention, Organic Gardening, Runner's World, and Bicycling. Men's Health was published in 99 countries. Rodale Inc. also published such classic books as The South Beach Diet, Doctor's Book of Home Remedies, Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore, and Onward by Howard Schultz. During her career, she worked in many circulations, leading the in-house advertising agency, strategic planning, and led the first brand integrated business, books, magazines, digital, and e-commerce for the organic living business. In 2009, Maria became CEO and chairman of the board leading the company through the great disruption and ultimately selling the company to Hearst uh, Publishing in 2018. In 2016, she launched the children's book imprint, Rodale Kids, which is now owned by Penguin Random House. She has also been involved as a board member and co-chair of the Rodale Institute, an independent scientific research and education nonprofit which studies regenerative organic versus chemical agriculture. And by the way, came out last year with Kiss the Ground, fabulous, wonderful project, which uh, highlights them in many ways. She was co-chair from 2007 to 2017 and still sits on the board. Her grandfather is considered the founder of the organic movement in America. From 2003 to 2011, she was on the board of Bette Midler's New York Restoration Project, and she also served on the Pennsylvania Federal Reserve Advisory Council from 2014 to 2017. She also served on the board of the multi-billion dollar nonprofit hospital, Lee Valley Health Network, if I said that correct. <clears throat> Lehigh Valley Health Network. Lehigh Valley Health Network. She has received many awards for her lifetime of service and activism, including the National Audubon Rachel Carson Award in 2004. Matter of fact, of Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, right here, which is an amazing honor. United Nations Population Funds Award for Health and Dignity of Women Everywhere in 2007 and the Audubon University International Quality of Life Award in 2014. 1985, she graduated from Muhlenberg College in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania with a dual major in communications and art. And in 2017, received an honorary doctorate degree from the Delaware Valley University. She resides in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and is the mother of 
three daughters and one son-in-law. She has one grandchild and one cat and 12 chickens. <laughs> Maria, it is a sheer pleasure to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to visit with us today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> So I've got a, a, a numerous amount of books here. So obviously, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, um, your organic manifesto, uh, a wonderful book. Um, have you have you ever read the one from the Prince of Wales from uh, Harmony, the Prince of um, Wales, or heard about it? I've I have it. I've paged through it. I can't say I've uh, read it cover to cover, but I've also heard him speak and I'm a, a great admirer of his work. I, I actually did want to ask that. So um, are, are, are your thought philosophies a little bit aligned? Because you do say you're, you're this um, detective and you want to really discover the mysteries of the universe and believe it or not, harmony. And also when he speaks, he really wants to show us and tie the mysteries of the universe to to us to connect us with this symbiotic earth and so i i figured a lot of your thoughts or maybe your discoveries were moving in the same direction well um like i said i haven't you know read him deeply but um you know we're both gardeners he and i are both gardeners and you know i think you have to be a little bit of a, a detective in search of the mystery of the universe to you know, really be a, a passionate gardener because everything is kind of um, interesting and, and mysterious. And uh, I, I did have the pleasure of going to um, visit Highgrove, which is his personal um, garden. And I would say he and I are very aligned in, in the, uh, the desire to create kind of magical spaces. So, um, so I feel very connected with him, although I, I, I mean, I've met him once, but I'm not really, you know. Wow, that's, that's um, beautiful. Yeah. There are so many inspirations and, and things that I cross cutting things and your work over the years, your activism, not only in, in gardening and farming and organics and, and now regenerative farming, also the Rodale Institute and, and uh, the wonderful things they've done and, and, and are continuing to do. Um, what, what your biography and what all this is, should be telling our listeners, my listeners, is basically, you've been doing this for a while. You, you, uh, I, I thank God you haven't g given up, or, or at least I hope you haven't, because this last 12 months at least has been a trying time on, on many different fronts and levels, not only uh, um, with the pandemic and the lockdowns, but you know, Black Lives Matter, the the Capitol uh, building incidents, the inauguration, all the things around that, the uh, Black Lives Matters, and you know, Belarus and and uh, the Bolsonaros, the Putins, the Shays, the Duartes, and all the numerous other crazy things going on around the world. Has has all your past activism? readings, knowledge, your discovery of the universe and how, how it works, giving you any preparedness, any resilience, say, I, I, I knew this craziness was going to come to the head. I was a little bit prepared. How have you weathered this time? <laughs> well, you just asked me about a hundred questions. So <laughs> um, first of all, I'm fine. I weathered it fine. Um, I've got my 12 chickens. So, you know, I have e plenty of eggs. <laughs> Um, I, you know, like most people around the world was very disappointed when Trump got elected and concerned and worried. And, um, and that actually led me, you know, before Trump, you know, I had focused both on the organic environmental space and personally, I'd also focused a lot on um, women's history and religious history. And that's like what the book, It's My Pleasure is, is more about. It's, it's about, um, you know, trying to understand why um, there's this dynamic between women and men in our world. And, um, but what the election of Trump did was it, and Black Lives Matter and all of that is it made me um, 
delve more deeply into, you know, race and caste and, um, you know, patriarchy and understanding, you know, the dynamic of, of um, uh, men and, and, and um, so it's been interesting. And I would say, optimistically that this is maybe the death knell of the patriarchy you know it's like kind of the last panicked you know the cornered vicious animal you know of male domination um even before trump was elected i i came to realize that how we treat nature is often how we treat women and that until we treat women with respect and dignity, we can't treat nature with respect and dignity. So they're, it's all connected. And I would say, I would put race in there as well. And I think what's come out a lot for um, those of us in America who are paying attention is the connection between not just pa patriarchy, but racism in agriculture in America and how we're still kind of operating on this kind of plantation slavery model, even though it's not illegal um, model. So, you know, um, whether it's Mexican immigrant farmers, you know, migrant workers or prison labor, um, we've got a lot of work to do. So I've actually spent the last four years um, working on a new book that's currently out for, because um, I don't own a publisher anymore, so I, I have to like find a publisher. <laughs> it's out for uh, potential acquisition which um, focuses on love, because I think that that's the thing that's missing in all of this is a real understanding of um, the power of love to address our issues and create resilience in the world. So that's that's real beautiful. And so in that respect, some some of that has prepared you, but I, I think you weren't uh, it definitely shown the microscope on on more of the problems more things bubble to the surface but that's beautiful to hear what, what i always say that all 12 of the uh, all 17 of the sustainable development goals are tied to agriculture seafood food and beverages but that the biggest way like paul hawk informs that to draw down our human suffering problems and our environmental problems, uh, especially our agriculture and food problems, is uh, to empower women and girls and to flip that paradigm, change that switch on how that relationship is, is intertwined. And you, you touch upon it. So in, in your answering the question, so I actually wanna go into that now, if you don't mind, uh, a little bit deeper because it's so important. Uh, not only are the majority of workers in agriculture, seafood, food and beverage, production, farming, uh, et cetera, um, big migrant workers, but also women and girls and usually underpaid and undereducated, not, uh, it's almost like you eloquently said it, a form of slavery, you know, it's a, 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 a abhorrent conditions and, um, this empowerment and changing the switch of how we see that world and flip that is such a vital role to be one of the top besides global food reform to really draw down and be a silver bullet to bring some equilibrium or change into the entire system that we so desperately need. Uh, the vice president, uh, 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 Camilla Harris, as a step in the right direction, uh, covering some bases, but there's so much more needed. How can you uh, tell me what more are you working on that front besides being a fabulous advocate for women and girls, but what, what else do we need to do and how can we flip that paradigm? Well, uh, you know, flipping the paradigm is the right phrase because I think we in the environmental food movement have been stuck in this paradigm that, um, you know, and, and I mean, I, we published Al Gore's book um, and I, you know, I know him well, but it's like, you know, if you just stop drinking bottled water and plastic, you'll solve the problem. It's like, it's, it's a personal thing that each person has to do, like, you know, stop using plastic grocery bags and, and, uh, 
you know, or, and then, you know, we've, we've spent more energy fighting amongst ourselves. You know, the, I call it, you know, the vegans, vegetarians versus the meat eaters, you know, like rather than actually like s s trying to solve the problem. And, you know, the, a thing that, you know, I, I realized as I was working on my book is that, um, you know, there's two ways to look at food. One is, you know, what you ingest. And the other way is like how it's grown. And the truth is how it's grown is so much more important to everybody than what you actually eat. Like I, I tell the story quite often of my, you know, my ex um, parents-in-law who, you know, both lived into their high nineties and ate, you know, cookies at every meal and, you know, and, and you know, didn't even know what organic was until they met me. And, and um, you know, they were happy and healthy and lived a long life, but you know, what you eat is personal. And that to me is like personal liberty and freedom. You know, we should all feel the right, you know, everything eats as Bill Mollison says, everything eats. So we've got to eat. And, you know, some people want to eat vegan, that's great. Some people want to eat meat, that's great. But the how food is grown is a collective, is a, is a communal thing. You know, chemicals it affect all of our health, whether you eat that food or not. Poison, you know, they poison the water, whether you eat that food or not. Um, and, um, you know, and they, chemicals take the, you know, disable the, the soil from storing carbon, which impacts all of us. So I think, you know, as a movement, we need to shift our paradigm to thinking, you know, who cares what you're eating? You know, <laughs> let's care about how we're growing and let's care about, um, you know, the impact that how we grow things has on all of us. And as it relates to, um, you know, women and children, and, you know, I think that's a deeper issue um, that, actually has more to do with sex <laughs> than um, anything political. It's how, you know, if you look around the world, you know, a lot of women and children um, are repressed and even in, you know, in Europe and in America, repressed because of, you know, our views on sexuality. Well, nature is sex, basically. Nature is like one giant orgy. <laughs> Yes. And we've got to get like comfortable with the idea of that and start freeing up, you know, people, you know, I think if men have healthier attitudes about sex, they won't need to like control women as much. And if women have more freedom about sex, they won't, you know, feel so like angry all the time. So it's, it's, it's really, that's where the reformation needs to happen, which is, um, you know, I'm not sure who all is talking about that yet, but that's, to me where the future is. You, is you kind of tickled in your book, Organic Manifesto, you tickled on sex as well. And also when, when we talk uh, GMOs or even uh, chemical fertilizers and, and mm -hmm. seeds and things on how they actually ra do a form of rape on, on the mm -hmm. other seeds. And so you tickle on that in the book in a couple of different ways um, as well. And so, um, I definitely think uh, you're, you're on to something. I also think it's a little bit, it's a little bit more systemic. So it's not just uh, that one facet of, of misunderstanding of sex, but I think there's a whole, whole complex sub subsystem in there that, that we're really missing and um, not, not understanding on, on, in a lot of different respects. So there was this great thing from Kate, uh, uh, Roworth, uh, who is the economist, the donut economy, and she really said it so nicely in, in, in um, a couple different ways, and I'd like to read it to you if you don't mind. Um, she called it weird societies, and um, she, it's basically an acronym for Western Educated Industrialized Rich and Democratic weird societies, um, it, it is here that most of the economic research, the thinking is conducted and thereby 
produces automatically a biased response. So we're getting a narrow view of that world picture because as you and I know that the majority of the, the, the migrant food workers, the food workers and the processes that are women and girls is the sheer majority there. Um, and, and in many other areas that that's not the same picture that we're seeing where all these studies and data and graphs come from. It's much yeah. a different view of the world. So I love, love how you kind of express that. And, and, and that in those situations, sex is a, is a big, uh, this male yeah. hierarchy and stuff is really creating numerous problems. Yeah, I write about in my in my new book um, about how we do need a whole new economic system and, and um, uh, that you know, in the current capitalist economic system, you know, women are basically like domesticated animals. You know, we, you know, we're for sale and we do work for free. And, you know, there's, there's no, um, uh, freedom in it. And the same is true of nature. You know, nature is not accounted for in capitalism. The guy who developed the, the original concept, I mean, he basically, he lived with his mother. <laughs> it's, it was a whole system created by entitlement based on the backs of domesticated women. And, um, you know, I think one of the both tragedies, but also like lessons of the pandemic is how much women are suffering because we don't have the systems for childcare that, you know, are, um, you know, a lot of women have had to leave the workforce because, you know, without childcare, um, it becomes harder and, and, and um, or impossible. So um, I do think that we're at a really interesting time, I mean, um, challenging times, but also interesting times in that, we have, we, we're in a very unique moment as a globe, because this is happening all, all over the world. And, you know, Trump isn't an isolated incident, you know, it's happening everywhere. You know? yeah. <laughs> that we have a moment to like reinvent and rethink and almost like redream the future that we want to create. And that to me is, is our mission right now. Absolutely. I'm totally in alignment with you. And uh, you, there's a couple of things that even, even in that, that I would like to unpack and go a little bit deeper if you're willing to share. So uh, I, I deal a lot with, believe it or not, someone who is environmentalist and also trying hard to get global food reform and change our food systems. Um, there's so many aspects that are cross cutting with economics Mm -hmm. And uh, there's so many uh, there are so many things that deal with being a futurist or someone who has this vision of what's the future, where are we going, and if we continue on these current models we've been on, uh, where is it going to take us? What will that future look like? And so, in some respects, you have to do a lot of forecasting, backcasting, and thinking about these uh, the futures, the different futures that are available for us, and. Um, <clears throat> In, in that there's this, uh, this interesting thing that with economics uh, and the, the, the weird societies, obviously Western way of thinking, most economists are men. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very selfish. They're very self-centered. It's me, me, me. How much money can I make? Yeah, they're white. And the other thing is, is they're also um, uh, some, some interesting things there is that they're easily corruptible, easily mm -hmm. bought. Right, <laughs> uh, which which is horrible, um, and so when I I think of Mariana Mazzucato or Kate Raworth or um, some of the other greats, I like Jeffrey Sachs, I like W. Edwards Deming as econ economists that that move forward, and you and I both had cross cuttings with the Federal Reserve of the United States and and some of the archaic type of thinking there. So I'm so glad they had you in there as an activist and advocate to stir up things and make sure uh, shit didn't go too wrong, which, you know, that there was a political divide. But what I'm getting to is that there's, there's definitely has to be a new system. There's definitely got to be a new economic model. 
and and you you touched upon that. I, I was wondering if you could kind of tease us what that looks like, and, and maybe if you let me share what I, I've also been thinking about that quite a bit. I'd love to exchange and see if they're aligned in some way. Uh, be happy to, but first I have to tell you a funny story about my Federal Reserve experience. Please, please. Um, when I first, it's a three-year term, you know, advisory term. And I, you know, I was asked to be on it because of my business background. And, you know, at that time I still owned the company. The first meeting um, I showed up and it was one of those like dark wood paneled giant conference rooms. And there was like a line of portraits along the wall of just all these men. <laughs> and I actually took like a surreptitious picture because it was like, it was so funny to me that, you know, here I was in this like hallowed hall of like white man manhood. And um, I, I can't say I made too much of an impact, but I will say by the time my three years was up, all those portraits were down and they were more like landscape photo painting. So, so I do think, you know, um, there's change happening, but it needs to happen um, more um, radically. And I think, you know, looking at nature as the model always, to me, that's always, you know, like when you have a, a mystery, how does nature look at it? Um, so for instance, you know, in, in the white male model, it's like growth, 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 growth. Well, you know, nature, there's cycles of growth and, you know, there's time for growth. There's a time for, you know, dormancy. And we see that happen in, um, in companies, you know, like the classic example is the railroad industry versus the automobile industry. You know, it's like things have their natural cycle. Um, and you can even see the pandemic now as like a, sort of a form of like, okay, you know, let's rest. <laughs> we need to rest. And so, um, being less fearful of those cycles and less desperate for growth at any cost um, is like the first step, I think. And being able to look at, okay, do, do things, do we make things better over time? And so, you know, I think I, I write about it in my book about, um, you know, regenerative agriculture regenerative organic agriculture, because that corruption thing is happening all the time. You know, oh, regenerative is the new buzzword. So now the big companies are like, we're regenerative. It's like, no, you're fucking not. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure. You're lie. fine. That's fine. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, what regenerative organic agriculture does, it, it, it actually makes the environment better over time. And that should be the model for any economy or economic model? Does it make everything for everyone better over time? And um, I do think, you know, um, going back to, you know, you said men are more corruptible. I mean, I've heard um, stories and I, 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 I don't have any like footnotes to document this, but that, you know, when you give money to, uh, it's not just a white man thing, it's a man thing. Um, you know, when you give money to, organizations in Africa, if you give it to the men, they tend to, you know, buy alcohol and, and gamble and buy, you know, whatever men yeah. buy, you know, but if you give it to the women, it actually helps people. <laughs> and um, I do think, I mean, it's not that like men are bad or terrible. I think a lot of it is how we've all been raised and that can change, but that's going to take a long time to change. So, um, so I think, you know, we just have to do the best we can to think long term about how do we make things better, you know, over time for everyone. Um, but that takes a love and a caring that you can't force on anybody. And a law can't make you do that. Yeah, I think there are some real universal laws or universal principles, and and we're all Homo sapiens, and we're all, we're all on the same planet Earth. You know, when when I you know I go back to this again when when you say you know this detective to find out the mysteries of the universe, Carl Sagan said it so wonderfully. Um, 
we are a way for the cosmos and the universe to know itself. And um, right. we, you know, we, uh, his first wife, Lynn Margulis, who's one of my mm -hmm. favorite superstars with mycorrhiza and, and, um, and the symbiotic earth and everything, she really came up with the symbiotic earth and that everything is interconnected and, and uh, really said neo-Darwinism is bullshit, neoliberalism is bullshit, and that uh, if we don't figure out that we are part of this regenerative world that we need to interact as a symbi symbiosis with uh, uh, um, the rest of the species and organisms on our planet, that we're doomed. And, and then you go back to Carl Sagan again, he said, uh, there's this emerging consciousness that the earth is seen as one organism and an organism divided amongst itself is doomed. And so uh, you, you touch upon so many things there that, that are just so beautiful and uh, a direction where we need to go. I, I dive uh, pretty deep and, and uh, in these subjects as well, because um, it's one of my passions. And I, I base it off of, you know, Herman Daly's ecological economics and, and you know, the, the global footprint, the replicable hectare that we have, that if we each had 1.6 global hectares that was replicable, meaning we could produce enough water, food, shelter, security for ourselves that we could live, you know, 90, 100, you know, well beyond into ripe old age uh, with good regenerative stewardship over the land, healthy soils and things like that. Uh, and how can we flip this capitalistic model or this uh, GDP models into an economy that's based more off of a global replicable hectare that uh, is a universal inalienable right for all human beings, that it's a planet and an economy for everyone, not just the weird societies as that acronym that I read, you know, kind of described. And, and uh, you know, I don't want to go in too much detail because it's really about the honor of having you here. But I think if we ingrain some of those practices, they're much more circular economy model, they're much more regenerative model that's long-term and it's not based on genders, based on this homo symbiose, this new right. evolution of how how uh, the mensch evolves into something much different and, and, and better. Yeah, well, um, I agree. And, um, you know, if you look up the definition of capitalism, it has scarcity, you know, in its definition. It's about, you know, utilizing scarce resources to, you know, whatever, make the most money. And um, I think that's what has to shift is that, you know, actually we've got plenty of resources here. You know, there's so much abundance here. And even like dividing it into, you know, hectares or acres, you know, it's like what we have is, is like, an opportunity for so much creativity and innovation. And I mean, there's so much land that um, is underutilized or misutilized that could be, you know, um, made so much more abundant for everyone. And when I say everyone, man, women, you know, men, women, bees, animals, you know, plants and fungi. And um, Darwin, I don't think Darwin, one, one of the things like I, came to in the process of doing researching and writing this book is like we can't look backwards anymore I mean or like we shouldn't waste our time trying to like you know discredit the past because everybody was doing something important like building a staircase you know <laughs> to the future and you know Darwin actually like to me his most important idea was that adaptation is really the key to evolution. And so I believe we are constantly evolving and bringing it even back to American politics, like, and circular, you know, circularness, you know, we're very much in this moment repeating what happened in the mid eighties, you know, with Reagan and, you know, and, um, you know, the moral majority and, and, 
you know, AIDS was the pandemic of the time. I mean, there's a lot of similarities, but if you actually go back and look at, you know, I just watched a documentary on the Reagans and, um, and I was working in Washington during that time period. So um, there's so many similarities, but we have evolved so much further, you know, back then nobody would come out as being gay. Now it's like, everybody can come out as being gay. Um, you know, the, the media has evolved, has evolved, you know, the, our, our language has evolved. Black people, you know, the black lives matter is so important, but like that would never have even come close to touching the surface in the eighties. So, um, so we're, we're making progress and we just have to keep, keep our eyes forward and learn from the past, but use our energy to create solutions and, um, make it fun for people. I think that's a lot of the resistance is fear. People are afraid, you know, oh, you know, what do you, how do you heat your home if you don't have coal? You know, <laughs> well, let's, let's find ways that are exciting to people. Um, and I think that's why Elon Musk is so, so successful because he makes it fun and exciting. Yeah. He's, he's basically taken that diffusion of innovation curve and made it more fun, more sexy, more affordable. Yep. Uh, and, and it just keeps approving. I mean, during the pandemic's amazing time after time, what he's just continued to reach milestones and advancement. He's moving forward to reach that future instead of complaining, groaning, moaning right. and groaning about the past. So I'm totally in line with it. Be, uh, the last thing I want to touch in, and then we'll kind of move forward to some, some other uh, discussions and, and, and topics is you're, I think, friends, or you've at least interviewed him a few times, John Mackey from uh, Whole Foods, and, and he kind of tickles or touches often on this capitalism thing, conscious capitalism. Um, matter of fact, I have uh, Conscious Leadership is this new book that he just came out with, and, and um, not to to pit you against any friends or contacts that you have. How, I mean, how, 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 you know, and I, matter of fact, I have another book here, the green swans by John Ellington Elkington. And right at the bottom there, his subtitle is the coming boom in regenerative capitalism. Yeah. Right. And, and so, um, I'm are, writing down are, that are, are, yeah, green swans. Are we bastardizing the, regenerative word to put a new shiny coat on capitalism or is there such thing as regenerative capitalism conscious capitalism uh, how is that evolving or do we do we truly need to separate ourselves from that and get into a, a, a different e economic model one that works for everyone yeah um so I'm not friends with John. Okay, Mackey. okay. I did interview him for Organic Manifesto. Um, I, you know, very much respect what he's done for, um, you know, for the food world with, you know, Whole Foods. I mean, we only actually just got a Whole Foods in my area like three years ago. So um, shows what kind of back backwater place I live. In. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, so I admire him as a business person. And I did actually, I spoke at um, the Conscious Capitalism uh, or event, yeah. conference, the things that they used to have in person. Yeah. <laughs> <We don't> <laughs> <know>. <laughs> You're um, dating uh, yourself. That seems so long ago. <laughs> it was like, I think it was maybe five years ago. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen that community up close and, um, uh, and I would say, you know, good for them for doing what they're doing. It's still very ego driven um, and male kind of domination driven. And that's fine. That's great. You know, we need that. I think, I don't think it should be one or the other. It should be partnership. You know, there are things that men do really well and there's things that women do really well. And I think all of us are kind of on a gender spectrum, you know, and we need each other. We need each other. So um, 
you know, how does that tie back to John Mackey? Well, you know, he's like a crazy vegan, you know, and um, a libertarian. And like, I, I, I think, um, like, I, I probably wouldn't be friends with him because we're like, we wouldn't know what to eat, you know? <laughs> yeah, there, there wouldn't be any alignment, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, like I said, I, I really admire and respect what he's done. And I think I think it's not like one day capitalism will stop and something new will start. Just like, you know, evolution, you know, something doesn't break out of an egg and it's something completely different. Well, some, maybe sometimes that does, but um, I think it'll happen in bits and pieces. And there's companies, you know, like um, Patagonia is always a great, a great company, you know, Dr. Bronner's, um, you know, some of the you know, organic Valley that are really trying to shift the model and, um, and doing well at it. Uh, there's also a group that I've been keeping an eye on that um, I have a lot of respect for in, um, I think they're in Virginia, um, Sylvan Aqua Farms. That's a kind of a collective of indigenous and people of color tr trying to really create a whole new model of how, um, how farming can work, how, you know, how, um, how marketing and, and, you know, thriving can happen um, without, um, without falling into the bad traps that have happened in the past. So, um, so I think it's gonna, you know, just like anything, you know, somebody will have a good idea and other people will follow it. And, you know, somebody else will have a different idea and other people will follow that. And um, over time we will um, get better. I, th I think really and somebody will put somebody will, some some white person man will put a word on it and be considered the founder <laughs> yeah I I, I, I I hope that you put a word on it and you're the founder because that, that's more the direction I I really think that we kind of need to the spin the plate of this economic model uh, and keep it up afloat uh, until we make the transition to some extent. To, to something better, but I do believe that that uh, that it's a, uh, I mean, human evolution takes millions to billions of years, but cultural evolution of human beings is one that can go pretty fast if we do it right and do it in a transitional uh, way. I personally, I, I am very biased. I believe that the, the, the world, um, goal, the plan for the future is the sustainable development goals. Um, it has all the factors in it, all the facets of very complex system to get us to not the best, but a, a little bit brighter 2030, December 2030. Um, and for me, that's a lot of hope because if as I look around there, whether it's donut economics, the, the new green deal in the EU, uh, uh, whatever things emerging out there, I just don't have the big hope that they're not one, not unbiased, that they're also not from this weird society from the Western world, uh, that they really are something for, for everyone that we can make that just a nice transition, not leaving anyone behind because through food, we realize that the, you know, the, the ones that are in poverty and are in hungry, um, it affects all of us. It affects all of our economies and all of our lives because we're all on the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, you um, discuss in your book, uh, Organic Manifesto, all the bullshit and craziness that uh, Bayer and Monsanto have done, the rape, the pillage, the, the hor horrific things. And thank you so much. There is... Uh, it, it's so needed. It's a wake up call. People are, are um, I hope, and that's kind of what I want to ask you with this next question is, is have gotten uh, awoken to the realization that it's, that it's a bad system that hasn't worked for us. It's really a, a go nowhere model that's hurting all sorts of things. Um, but I, I'm getting ready to have on my show here in a couple of weeks. 
Carrie Gillum, I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's an investigative journalist, reporter. Um, she's written a couple books, but she just released the Monsanto papers. Mm. And well, actually, matter of fact, I think it comes at the official release date is March, but I got a free copy. Um, it, and I believe with all your past experience, you know how that went. Um, uh, uh, yippee, I'm so glad it went that way. You know, uh, uh, an organization paying out billions of dollars, you know, and someone uh, receiving cancer and many thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands of people affected negatively through these chemical fertilizers and pesticides. What, um, not only from the activism, maybe did, did you receive from what you wrote in your book, threats and, and, and problems or people, you know, mad at you and you actually went and spoke with the farmers. Uh, and then at, through all these years, since the books came out um, and, and your work, have you seen that we're starting to make a shift? We're waking up, we're pulling our head out of our ass and moving in the right direction for the least regenerative organic or even just organic into another direction? Um, oh, again, that's a very big question. Um, there was a moment when I was writing Organic Manifesto when I had to ask myself, am I willing to die for this because there was so much negativity out there um, and viciousness. Um, and, you know, like I'm a mom, I've got kids and um, uh, I think I was even pregnant when I was writing it. And um, I just said, I don't wanna die, but I have to tell the truth. What I've since, See, learned, you know, because I wrote Organic Manifesto like 10 years ago. Yeah. Longer, 2009. 2009. Was that what Monsanto and Bear have done has been replicated, you know, I mean, it was a replication of, you know, it's the tobacco industry, it's the sugar industry, it's the meat industry, it's, you know, it's the model that has been, um, you know, a bunch of people want to get really rich. <laughs> They're willing to do whatever it takes and harm as many as people, as many people as possible to do it. Scientists are complicit because they're bought for sale, you know, through university research. And, um, you know, and the media is like not educated enough to like really understand it, what's happening. So they're like, they're kind of, they get swept along into it, you know, and, and, and I mean, I write a lot about this in my new book about um, how advertising is part of it too, because, you know, advertisers want the sexy new thing. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm a formal, former magazine publisher, you know, you want the new, you know, oat bran will save your life. Or, you know, if you cut out all fat, you know, cause that's what sells things, you know, um, to people. So it's this like whole ecosystem that left, right, you know, everybody's complicit in. Um, so how do you, oh, and, and then I think what the, that's actually what has led to this moment in time where there's complete lack of trust in pharmaceutical companies, complete lack of trust in government, complete lack of trust in, um, in the media, you know, because yes, we've all been like, sucking money out of people to get rich. <laughs> and so, you know, of course, QAnon and, and, you know, they're just, they're just playing the same game. You know, how can we take advantage of this fear that people have and suck our, our money out of it or get our agenda across? So, um, so, you know, the first step, like being an alcoholic, the first step is to be aware <laughs> that we have a problem. <laughs> We've got a problem, you know, it's all of us. It's not just you know, it's not just Monsanto and Bear, you know, it's, it's all of us because we're all partaking in it. And then, you know, and then like saying, okay, stop, you know, stop. 
how are we going to change this? And what's interesting to me, I, you know, I'm very active on, on Facebook and I have this weird community of friends I went to high school with, public high school, who are Trump supporters. And I've like purposefully not, you know, like blocked them because I want to understand them. Um, and then, you know, all the foodie organic people. And, you know, the one thing they have in common is, is organic food. And for the public school people, it's because they all had health problems, you know, and organic food was the only thing that kind of made them, you know, feel healthier. Um, but yet in politics, we haven't realized that that is a uniter, a potential uniter. Um, I'm also active on Twitter and um, I don't know if you follow David Hogg, who is one of the Parkland shooting survivors. And he's been in this fight with my pillow guy and now he's launching a, you know, an, like a, a democratic progressive pillow company <laughs> to compete. Um, but I, I had a taste of this, you know, social, you know, I, I said something like, please make it organic. And all of a sudden, you know, these like trolling haters came out for the first time in a long time, you know, I saw, oh yeah, I remember you guys. But if you click on them, you know, they have two followers. Um, so I do think there are, there is like a whole industry out there that's just, the bullying industry and we have to just say you know what i don't care about you i'm yeah. moving forward you talk yeah. about it in your book it's not only like the smoke uh, tobacco industry but it's also like the chemical industry how they have this counter not only the lobbyists but they have these counter people who come and they just lie to your face and say whatever right. try to discredit you you know, there was a, a, a book that ties into this. It's brand new too. It uh, just barely came out. Climate Wars from Michael Mann, Mann the new climate war uh, from Michael Mann. And he, he says the same thing uh, as, as you did in your book, a little bit more. It's not about the, the individual. It's about these big organizations that are really uh, leading these campaigns against it. And, and um, you know, they always want to get the activists or the users of those products uh, or, or belief systems to fight against each other. And then they've got the, th the whole, whole thing tied up in one because we can't even unify against ourselves and, and, and respect. They're just trying to sway you yeah. know, their direction. But, but I would say part of why I'm writing this book on love is that I think the model of war using, you know, like I'm fighting cancer, the war against cancer, the war against drug, the war against the climate war, you know, boom, boom, boom. It's like, come on, like war just creates more pain and suffering. What we need is healing <laughs> and what we need is love because healing happens when love is applied. That's it, you I know? Agree. And even like when, you know, when, when I'm, you know, having conversations with my Trump supporting Facebook friends, you know, it's, it's like love is the only thing that works, you know, <laughs> love and, and you never change them. You don't, ch we can't change them, but we can like respect the differences and agree on what we can agree on. And those of us who believe in a future of love can move forward with love instead of getting like tied into this, like it's a fake war. <laughs> oh, it definitely is. I, I, oh. I, I ask people the question, I'm gonna ask you as well. Um, what does a world that works for everyone look like to you? And I'm gonna have you answer it in just a second, but I wanna caveat it. I ask that to thousands of people, all, all, all my guests, but I've done studies and videos of people as well. One the answer is all different, but we really need a world that does work for all of us. And whether it's it's love or, or you know, w once we start getting into religion or democratics and republics and dividing ourselves, you know, th that's never been a world that works for everyone. There's only works for the weird societies or a select few, but it doesn't work for everyone. Well, if we haven't realized that we need a world that works for everyone, because that's the only way we're going to continue, because there is no place on this earth to hide. I'm in Germany. I'm in Hamburg, Germany. And you and I were discussing 
all the crap about the Trumpocalypse and the inauguration and all these these things on on the craziness. Um, and I'm I'm should be distanced from that, but I'm not because the decisions made there affect me in Germany and the decisions that the Bolsonaro's make in, in Brazil to let the Amazon rainforest burn affects me in Hamburg and affects you in, in the United States and Pennsylvania and, and all over. And, and we need to come to that paradigm shift, that realization, you know, we're all connected with this homo symbiosis. But now I'd love to get your answer on that as what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, I think it starts with um, how we raise and educate our children, you know, and sort of, I think so much of the problems in the world start with trauma, childhood trauma, you know, whether it's sexual trauma, physical trauma, war trauma so so we want to create like a world where children feel safe children feel loved you know mothers and fathers feel empowered to love those children and aren't like um you know desperate to to you know escape or or you know that they feel fulfilled in that relationship with each other um, or feel free to leave it in a way, you know, that, um, so I, I think freedom is really important. And that's, you know, freedom of religion, freedom of, um, you know, beliefs. Um, but that starts with raising confident, educated children of both genders. And I think, you know, when you, when women are free, they don't have to live their dreams through their children. And that makes everybody happier. <laughs> um, and then, you know, like, then it's a creative, fun solution, you know, like, oh, you know, how can we grow more food? Oh, well, but there's a place, you know, and we've got roofs and we've got, you know, or how can we get around? It's like, oh, let's invent some new, you know, sailing ships, you know, or, or um, um, you know, how can we organize ourselves? Well, let's sit down and talk about it and figure it out and not, you know, and, and, and that freedom, I think it should be, I think people should be free to get rich. I mean, you're never going to like stop that impulse from people. So, you know, I'm not a communist or even a socialist the way, you know, I, I think there should be the freedom for people who want to make money to make money. But I also think then there should be a, a culture, whether it's governmental or, or social of like taking care of people, taking care of everyone. Um, but I think that's only gonna happen through how we raise our children and through education. And, and, um, and that is gonna happen through love. You consider yourself to be a global citizen and how would you feel about a world with the removal of all borders, walls, divisions, limitation of humanity, one from another. And, and what is kind of your view and your understanding of this? Um, I think people need boundaries. <laughs> we need personal boundaries and we need, you know, um, land, you know, I think there's probably some evolutionary science that's been done or that needs to be done about, you know, like sizes of communities and what's sustainable and how to manage it. And, and, you know, if you just like say, okay, we're all free and everything, you know, that's, you know, you can't just erase and ignore people's culture and people's ancestry. And, and, um, uh, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania and, Pennsylvania is right next to New Jersey, which is right next to New York City. And we're all very different <laughs> and that's okay. Um, even within Pennsylvania that we're, we're all different. And um, you know, I'm part German and part Jewish and part, you know, who knows what else, you know, but um, I think saying something like, oh, let's erase all borders 
scares people and isn't really necessary. You know, just like, um, uh, you know, saying, oh, all families should live together. It's like, no, you know, people need their space. <laughs> people need their space. <laughs> I tried that last summer. It was great. It was great. But, you know, we all are happy to be on our own again. And, um, uh, but I think what's interesting, the most interesting thing is how social media is actually erasing um, borders and barriers. And, and, um, and like, I think, you know, Black Lives Matter was happened because people taking videos of black people getting killed by police was like, oh my God, you know, you could have told me about that and I might've believed you, but I see it. And even, I, you know, I watched the Capitol raid happening live and um, I was like, where are the police? What, what, why are there no police? You know, I've seen the riot groups for the Black Lives Matter people and they're not here. There's something going on here. And I think that that's what cracked open the whole conversation for America was everybody saw it, you know, who was paying attention, that the police were in on this. And um, at least some of the police were in on it. And uh, so I think we just have to be realistic, but also hopeful and um, constructive. That, that's so interesting, the, the, the way you uh, formulate that. And there's so many, it's so complex. It's complexity science, what we're dealing with. And it's different in the United States, obviously, than it is in, in, in Europe, uh, especially even in Germany. The reason I ask you that question, um, and I, I thank you for your views, is that the pandemic was a global citizen. Mm -hmm. It didn't have any borders or nations or divisions. Um, the uh, air we breathe, the water we drink, it didn't have any borders. The species didn't have any borders. And the thing that you and I are passionate about, food, did not have any borders. It was a global citizen. All of those things were a global citizen. We're breathing the same air that Gandhi used to breathe, that uh, you know Julius Caesar or uh, uh, Marcus Aurelius or uh, um, Aristotle and Socrates used to used to breathe, and and, and you're the same that your grandfather and my grandfather used to breathe. Uh, drinking the same water, it's all regurgitated and reprocessed in a regenerative process here on our earth, and so. Um, I, I definitely do not ever want to caveat that way of thinking with the removal of our indigenous cultures, our heritage, our, cult, uh, our, our just in, ingrained culture, even if we're from a very short generational family where there is not a lot of history or culture involved that that was passed on. Um, but more in the, the bigger aspect of the way the, the world works, um, that the Sahara deserts and the, the, the sub-Saharan sandstorms that travel clear across to the Amazons to seed the clouds and seed the ground as fertilizer in the Amazons. And then the huge cloud rivers that then take that and, and, and hit the Andes and drop into our oceans to with diatoms to feed our oceans. And such is the cycle of life and at the much bigger cosmic perspective of the world. And, and I've even had a guest on our show, uh, Dr. Parag um, Kanan, and, uh, Kana, and he is uh, big on geospatial data and maps, satellite data and these different maps. And the World Trade Organization and global trade has a different map than the map that you and I are used to of the world. If we look at the logistics and the supply chain and the trade of our world, it's, it is a global citizen, it has been for years and they've got it figured out. And so um, sometimes, especially where, where we're in this lockdown, it's really easy when we see these borders walls, the divisions and you're locked down that we're thinking, what's going on? What's our world come to and what, what are we facing? And why are, why are we now being cooped up in our human zoos? Um, and, and so, you know, not all of us are fortunate like you and I to, to be in these beautiful human zoos that, that you can say, wow, okay, it's, it's fabulous. So, some of us are trapped in pretty tight spaces and we're like, this 
the human zoo was not made for 24 seven and I'm gonna strangle somebody, you know, because that's just how it goes because we're not always made to be lived in these and we didn't design them to live 24 seven in them. Most of us are a lot, a lot of people. And so these things bubble to the surface and I really wanted to kind of get your feelings and, and, and thoughts on that. And that's kind of the backstory uh, of how, how that works. Uh, and well, I would go back to looking at how, you know, nature again, you know, because nature has, you know, yes, everything is connected and I completely believe everything, but there's also like ecosystems. So, you know, a pond is one ecosystem and then it's nested in the forest ecosystem that it's a part of and that's nested in, you know, um, maybe the region and, uh, you know, so, so you have all these different levels and, you know, at the top are, you know, is the, the um, you know, the atmospheric ecosystem and then you have the planet as an ecosystem but that's nested within you know the solar system and the galaxies and you know the universe so so i think um there's a kind of a a natural desire to be both part of some a smaller ecosystem but also connected to the bigger ecosystem and if we can like just stop trying to be like Try, you know, we can shift out of the war mentality and be to, to the like partnership collaborative mentality, then it's fun to work together and we can solve everybody's problems. And nobody has to be better than anybody else because everybody's just different and it's okay to be different. And that's really where, where when you with Rodale Institute and with what your work has done with regenerative organic, Regenerative to me is like fixing the microcosmos, the, the, the microorganisms in our soil, fixing right. how, how we do agriculture. It's very biodiverse, but it's also these smaller ecosystems that self-sustain themselves and, and kind of spread that. Can you tell us a little bit more your thoughts, philosophies, and ideas, how you've seen this movement evolve and, and maybe get us up to speed, but also give us your visions of where where we're going with this, what you're seeing, maybe with Kiss the Ground, maybe with, I don't know how aligned you are with Dr. Zach Bush and some of these mm -hmm. biome and, and these integrated systems, uh, that, that would be great. Yeah, well, um, you know, let's go back to the original um, farming systems trial research that the Rodale Institute did, uh, which started in the early 1980s because back then, you know, the media and scientists were saying, well, there's no research that organic is, is better. So, you know, and, and no university would touch it. So, you know, my father said, okay, I'm going to start a scientific study. And he hired a PhD scientist to say, you know, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't, this is just my donation. I don't you know, want any false outcomes. I want to just see what happens. And it was originally called the transition study to see how long would it take to transition to organic and what happens over that time. So in five years, they found that, um, uh, you know, it, there's a dip at first going to organic that, um, that uh, you know, the soil is kind of like going, uh, <laughs> And you have to rebuild it up with with you know manure and, and and cover crops and everything. So after five years, what we found was that organic was actually um, uh, just as productive and just as profitable, and it required less outside inputs, and um, it actually was more resilient in droughts and floods because the soil was healthier. So okay, five years is done. It's like well, let's just keep going with this and see what happens. And so it wasn't until the 90s, you know, after my father passed away, that we started looking at the soil, we meaning they, scientists on staff, started looking at the soil and going, wait a minute, there's something different here. Um, there's so much more microorganism, is, you know, the fungi, the bacteria, the microorganisms. And then we started studying, uh, looking at the carbon. And I was like, wow, you know, the carbon here in this organic soil is um, 
much higher than the chemical soil. And over time, we're still seeing the you know, higher profitability, higher product productivity. And my father, when he was alive, came up with the idea of regenerative. He's like, we want to make the soil better. We want to make the land better. And he tied it to human health in that like, you know, if you cut yourself, your body naturally tries to heal. You know, that's regeneration. Um, so, um, so, you know, the climate science and connection with soil and carbon came out of that study as well. And, um, you know, the microbiome in our guts wasn't even really discovered or, until around the same time. So I think what happens is we, as tools developed and as our intellect develops, we start to see things that we couldn't see before. Okay, so now we see it, now what do we do about it? And what other research do we need to do? So one of the um, things I'm most excited about now at the Rhode Island Institute is we've switched to, well, I mean, we're still doing the farming systems trial, which is great, um, but we're doing veg a vegetable systems trial. So we're looking at vegetables and what we're finding, because we started with organic soil and now we're doing chemicals, we're starting to see the nutrient nutrient um, and we're, we're starting to see the decline. Instead of the rise, we're seeing the decline. So we can kind of like prove basically that regenerative organic is not just better for the environment, but better for health and better for farmers. However, you still have a lot of resistance of farmers to shifting to organic or regenerative organic. And a lot of that has to do with um, their mindset, how they were raised, they don't want to be, they don't want to um, feel like they lived their whole life doing the wrong thing. Um, uh, their bankers don't want to take the risk because it's a financial investment. As, as one farmer said, you know, I had to go back and ask for money to put back in all the fences and trees that they'd given me money to take out before, you know, so that he could use his tractor. So, so the, the real, um, I think the science is there. The real challenge going forward is how do we shift people's behavior, farmers behavior um, and government behavior to stop subsidizing um, chemical ag, you know, stop, stop subsidizing chemical companies or, and oil companies which are connected. So um, I think, we're at a really great moment actually in that, um, you know, the fact that regenerative, the word regeneration is bubbling up so much. Um, and like I said, my father, you know, I remember him telling me in the car one day, he's like, you know, I think, I think you know, the regenerative idea is like the most important thing I've ever come up with. And then he died. And then like nobody said the word regenerative for like 25 years. <laughs> and then now it's like kind of rising up. It's like, you know, he planted the seed and it took a while to sprout, but now it's sprouting. And I think that's, that's the road forward for healing for all of it, us. It definitely is. I, um, and it's also, for, uh, at least for the next decade, if not for the next century, regenerative is the the big topic like i showed you in the book green swans it's regenerative capitalism but um the united nations has set forth um uh last year actually that this will be the next decade of regenerative not only regenerative ag regenerative economies regenerative capitalism and on and on because there's regenerative societies regenerative cities and it's, uh, I, I don't want to negate or have it lose its value as we now put these buzz terms on it because uh, what I'm struggling with is that how do we explain regenerative to all those people? They're like, okay, we were just talking about sustainability and then we went and talked about resilience and then we we're talking about corporate social responsibility and then we we're talking about environmental social governance. <laughs> They're like, oh shit! What, what's the new? Okay, the new word is regenerative, and and they're they're getting it's getting lost in translation. Or they're trying, okay, we got to squeeze in. How are we regenerative? Well, it's not a model that you 
wait until the end of the year after, after you've done all your work and stuff and say, how can we squeeze the word regenerative in front of everything that we did last year? You know, that's, that's not how it works. It's a different way of understanding. And that's kind of in our discussion today, we've touched on it. We've kind of gotten a little bit deeper on, on, on what it means or where it's going and, and, and that as well. That, that it's all interconnected, that it's, uh, it's these seasons of life, it's this uh, biodiversity and this whole ecosystem that's different, that's, uh, that restores and regenerates itself over time. Yeah, well, I think, I think you know, first of all, I, I do wanna say that that whole holistic part of regeneration was there from the beginning. And in fact, my first job title when I worked for my father, um, I after college, I went and worked in Washington and he was like, you have to come back and work for me. And um, he, together we came up with the title, but it was more him giving it to me of um, coordinator of regenerative spirituality and psychology. <laughs> because yeah. at, at that time he was looking at, um, you know, he was working on, you know, community building um, because, you know, chemical farming had destroyed communities. You know, how can we regenerate, regenerate towns? How can we regenerate people's health? Um, so it was, you know, again, that nesting, it was always a very holistic, complete philosophy. Um, I only stayed in that job for like a year and a half because nobody took me seriously in the business. So I had to like get like a real job in the business. But, um, but that was my personal passion from the beginning. And, um, so I think, and then, you know, in, in Organic Manifesto, I write about the word sustainable and how that was kind of like a compromise fail word from the beginning, you know? So I don't have any um, sadness about seeing that by yeah. the death. Um, but I, you know, I think that the simple thing about regeneration is it just, it makes things better. Does, you know, does it make things better? Like for everyone, that's the question. Yeah, it's Does it make a, it's, my body better? Does it make the earth better? Does it make my community better? Does it make the soil better? That's all. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a system that can go on for infinity. It's a it's a closed loop, uh, infinite model that uh, is like the seasons of life, and and you know eventually the bigger universe or the bigger planetary scale that uh, after billions of years, if we and maybe less if we if we keep going on the Anthropocene, um, we'll end up, but actually it's a model that really can be pushed out into the future and, and infinitely if we do it right and if we understand our close connectedness to, to that entire system. Um, <clears throat> I have three, four big last questions for you because we're we're already getting into it. I could speak hours with uh, with you about this because I'm. I just know you're the expert, and and uh, you've been doing this a long time. I'm I'm actually have to confess I'm a huge fan and, and uh, um, of everything that you, that you've touched or you've done, and and so I'm excited to to be able to have this time. But I want to ask you the hardest question, and that is the burning question. Uh, and that we've all been asking ourselves this last 12 months, and it's WTF, the burning question, but it's not the swear word that we have also been asking and pulling out our hair. It's what's the futures? What's the futures for us for, from your perspective? Not for governments, not from politicians, not from Pennsylvania, for Maria Rodell. For me personally, well, I'd like to find an island that's in the Caribbean <laughs> and grow some fruit trees. Um, but, you know, for me personally, it's just, it's um, love, nature, um, serving my purpose, uh, exploring. I mean, I feel like I've made a lot of progress in solving things, mysteries that have confounded me, but I don't think, you know, um, I've solved all of them. And then, you know, turning that into action, you know, what can I do to have an impact and what can I do to leave it better? That's really the question, you know, that's beautiful, you know, cause I'm like, you know, I'm getting older. So time is finite. 
Yeah, you're not that old. You've got one grandchild. I've got four grandchildren. I've got wow. four, four adult children. Um, <laughs> I, 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 and I'm probably pushing great grandpas fairly soon if they're still on this exponential trajectory that my kids are. But um, uh, that, that's that's a that's a good thing. Um, it's kind of like you know the what I hear out is the golden the golden rule. You know, treat people and planet how you'd like to be treated, and leave the planet as a better place than we found it. And and I see that in, in your work and in your writings. But there's also that big aspect of this activism that you're calling people's bullshit. That you're telling them. The real deal are you trying to get the truth out there because there there are a lot of uh, of, uh, of things that we're dealing with just to touch on one one thing you you know you published al gore's book and for years i was really struggling to get him to talk about food at all and he just would not talk about food and now he's finally jumped on the bandwagon hallelujah but he just had this problem, but but also he had some skeletons in his closet. You know, a tobacco farmer family, Angus beef farmer, and um, and whatever, which I I don't think was a problem. I mean, uh, we've all made mistakes. We've all fucked up. We, you know, there is a way to pull out. There is a way to to fix those problems. But there are some some issues there, and I I am trying to tie this in with what you experienced at the Rodale Publishing, because as you mentioned it, you also had to deal with what, what ads are we gonna run? What kind of marketing, you know, and what brands or products we're gonna push and things. And some of those were, and still are absolute shit, you know, for our world, not definitely not organic. So how do you deal with that? How do you, how do you live in both those worlds or how do you make it work for yourself uh, without well, giving up your hands and throwing, you know, giving up? Well, actually, you know, um, it was getting increasingly hard for me when I owned the company to live in both worlds because, you know, organic was never a moneymaker for us. We always lost money on the organic stuff. Um, it was an investment. <laughs> And on the health side, you know, it was like celebrity weight loss. I just didn't believe in it. And, but that was what sold and that's what made the money. And, you know, when we sold the company, it was not because, um, you know, I said, let's sell. It's like the next generation of kids saying, you know, we don't want to own this business. And once I like, was like, you know what, once I put my ego aside and said, it's not important for me to succeed at this in order to be happy and successful. Um, it was the most freeing thing of my life to sort of walk away from that and, um, and not have to be a part of that. Like, you know, and I'm putting like, you know, the health food movement, you know, it's it all, it's not bad. It's just, it's all people just trying to like, you know, hustle and, 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 um, and it's, you know, I believe in health food. I, you know, but, um, you know, you see the underbelly of things. And so for me, it's been incredibly freeing to not own that stuff anymore. But what I saw from owning it, I saw two things because, you know, when, by the time we sold, we had a lot of, um, internet data. We had a hundred million, you know, people using our websites all the time, that what people really are like angsty about is sex. <laughs> and where change really has potential to happen is with children. And um, so that's why I launched Rodell Kids. And I actually simultaneously, so you asked what's the future for me. Um, I launched, I published some books under a pseudonym, some children's books under a pseudonym that have turned out to be doing really, really well. And so I'm hoping in my future, I'm able to write more um, children's books. I don't control, you know, the publishing of them anymore. So, uh, but that, they have actually come back and I've done more and they're coming back again and I'll do more. Um, but I do think it's the stories that we tell that really have the biggest impact. And not just the stories that we tell to our children, but the stories that we tell to each other as, um, 
adults about, you know, love and relationships and, and, and that's where the change is really going to happen. Well, we've already added you to the website menu B as a contributor, and I'm looking forward to a contribution from you for the book, Menu B, People and Planet Food Saving Solutions. Um, uh, I could think of no better voice to represent uh, women and girls and this big, big movement. And um, so I'm excited for that. But I only have three questions left for you, and then we're done. And it's really their selfish uh, takeaways for my listeners um, to give something back to them. And if there was one message that you could depart to them as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change my listener's life, what would it be your message? Stop fighting and start asking yourself, what would love do? How, what should I do if I, do it from love. It's a simple question, but it's like, it's hard. What should the next generation or new youth uh, in your field, whether it's gardening, farming, publishing, activism, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make real, true, lasting impact? Question everything and don't be afraid to come up with new ways of doing things. And don't be afraid of offending older people because we deserve to be offended. <laughs> and, and the last one is really, uh, I, I believe mo most people answer it this way, some, some don't, but uh, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start. Most people say, oh, it was the journey. I needed the journey to learn. But is there anything that you said, damn, I wish I would have learned that from the start. I would have done a little bit different. Um, I think the biggest thing I've learned that has the most regrets tied around it is like, I wish I would have had more confidence in myself and believed in, in myself and my gut. You know, the microbiome in my gut was talking to my brain and I let my brain go, but you know, really? And every time I went along with things where I didn't listen to my gut or believe in my own self. And you know, a lot of that is like, I was a woman at a time when not a lot of women were in business. And you know, all the whole, like I would say something and people, you know, men wouldn't just, wouldn't hear it even, you know, it's like, just went under their radar. Um, but I wish I would have had more confidence to say, listen to me, you know, listen to me, damn it. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm right. <laughs> and instead, you know, you let it play out. And then it's like, oh, I was right. I was right. They should have listened to me. <laughs> Well, you are right, and you've you've had an ex uh, exemplary life so far, and so much more to do. Uh, you've got the already working on the next generation. So, um, I really appreciate you being on the show, Maria. It's been a sheer pleasure, and we're gonna have to do it again for maybe for Menu B. We'll come back on, or I'll follow up uh, next year with you and see what you're up to, and uh, get a catch up. And especially when I'm traveling again when we're out of this lockdown i'm going to come come by pennsylvania yeah and most people don't know this i i i spent some time in pennsylvania but in pennsylvania they have unique Am amish and mennonite names for their towns and their cities and you have to go through foreplay to get to intercourse or if you're gone in the wrong direction you do it vice versa but there's some unique places where you live beautiful farm country and beautiful country in general. So um, I definitely would love to swing by and tell you hello and drop you off some copies of Menu B. That would Thanks be awesome. so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much, Marie. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah. Bye.